My name is Alex Mariani, and I am a volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, and we are here on Can TV. I am joined today by Maddie Urig, uh, who is also a Citizens Climate Lobby volunteer and is the president of the college chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby for the Illinois Institute of Technology. Maddie, thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Uh, so before we get into Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, can you just talk a little bit about climate change, what it is, and, and why we might want to mitigate it? Yeah. So climate change is new trends in the entire Earth's climate system. And these trends will take place over decades. And right now, our global temperature is showing an upward trend over the past hundred or so years. And basically what that means is it's getting warmer. So these warmer temperatures are triggering extreme weather events, things like droughts, hurricanes, and wildfires. And they're actually causing some places to become uninhabitable. Uh, and when you say some places to become un uninhabitable, what are some of the places that are being most affected? Places, areas, types of communities, uh, you know, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so there are a lot of different varieties of places that are unexpectedly affected by climate change. Mm -hmm. And there's communities that are already vulnerable in other aspects of their life. Um, and now because there's some changes triggered by the warming planet, they're even more at risk. So natural disasters are happening more frequently and in a higher intensity. And low income communities are very vulnerable to these negative effects of climate change. So if you think about it, they have less resources to evacuate in case their homes become uninhabitable, and they really don't have the resources to retrofit their homes if there's a big flood coming or a hurricane coming or something like that. So areas of low income and things like that are very at risk for climate change. Um, but even just in general, city infrastructure is also at risk um, from these floods. You know, roads aren't set up to face floods several times a year. And so cities are having to repair roadways and things like that, close down highways, bridges are collapsing. So there's a lot of just general life things that are affected by climate change. Um, but there's also some coastal communities that are affected as well. So if you want to take a look at this graph, basically this is showing flooding in all of the coastal cities across the United States. And it compares trends from the 1950s to the 2010s, so the past decade. Um, and as you can see, in just about every single city, there are more floods per year. Um, the, like I said, the orange bar is representing floods in the 1950s and the blue bar is representing floods now. So these floods are happening at an increased frequency um, and that kind of thing is just wreaking a lot of havoc on these coastal communities. Some places that you know previously were not underwater are now underwater. Um, and so one of the things that people don't think about a lot with flooding in coastal communities is it actually affects agriculture as well. Um, so if it's salt water, so as it floods, you know, crops that are used to being watered with fresh water are ruined. Um, sometimes the floods will get into water sources for these areas. So that just introduces a whole lot of different problems for these coastal communities. In general, flooding is happening more all over the United States. The air is more saturated, so when it rains, it rains a lot more. And, you know, rivers are seeing storms that they've never seen before, so they're flooding areas. Like, even here in the Midwest, 2019 was actually the most rainy summer that we've seen. Um, the soil actually got saturated, and it was crazy the amount of floods that we saw this year. Um, so another example, actually, just in 2017, this is a picture of Houston, Texas after Hurricane Harvey hit. Wow. So Hurricane Harvey stalled over the city of Houston for 48 hours and dumped 52 inches of rain in two days. And so these kind of intense storms are happening more and more frequently. And like I said, these are just some examples of the... Um, unforeseen weather consequences of climate change. Okay, great. Uh, and then you, what, you know, you talked about Houston, you talked about coastal cities, what, what sort of um, 
threats does climate change pose here in Chicago? What, what threats does yeah. it pose to us? So I did briefly mention the Midwest saw more floods this past summer than they have ever in the past. And Chicago is not immune to these this flooding. Um, and then we also are having things like the polar vortex in the winter and extreme heat waves in the summer. And these types of temperature fluctuations are just going to get more extreme and start happening more frequently. And these changes in weather are actually affecting crops. And because crops, you know, they might get completely wiped out by a really cold spell in the winter or a flood might cause the soil to become oversaturated. Um, so crops just aren't going to be growing as well. And that's going to cause the price of produce to raise for us. Mm -hmm. So while we're not maybe affected as much as a coastal place by the weather, we're affected by the effects of the weather. So things like that. Um, we are in a better position, like I said, than coastal communities. Um, we don't have to worry about droughts either because we have Lake Michigan. Um, but we actually may have to start supporting climate refugees. And those are people that can no longer live somewhere because their home has become uninhabitable from either flooding, extreme temperatures, and things like that. All right, great, thank you. Um, so we've talked about climate change, we've talked about where it happens, sort of how it happens, uh, why it happens. Uh, but of course there's always folks out there who say that climate change isn't real or they say climate change is real but it's not caused by humans. Um, is that sort of opinion in line at all with um, any of the scientific studies or research that, that are, that's out there? Yeah, um, so 97% of the scientific community agrees that climate change change is anthropic, which means it's caused by humans. And an interesting graph to look at, this is the rise of carbon dioxide emissions plotted right next to the average global temperature. So as you can see, um, this is from this like 1880 until current day. Um, and the industrial revolution happened right around the 1920s. Mm. So as you can see, there's a sharp spike in the carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere, and there's also a rise in the global temperature. Um, so it's pretty clear that these trends are correlated, and therefore to mitigate climate change, CO2 emissions need to be controlled. And less CO2 means less risk for climate change. Got it. Um, so we need to reduce CO2 emissions, but you know, another... Um sort of common uh, common opinion out there is that, you know, if, if we reduce our CO2 emissions here uh, in, in the United States, but people uh, in China and India and, con and in countries like that, if they're not reducing their CO2 emissions, uh, if they're not tra fighting climate change, then does, does it even matter if we here in the United States do? Yeah, so that seems to be a pretty common perception. People are having about the climate crisis. Um, China and India do have very dense populations and they demand a lot of energy, but the United States actually emits more carbon emissions per person than either China or India or any other country in the mm -hmm. world. So China and India have also both signed the Paris Agreements, an agreement through the United Nations, which countries have committed to making efforts to keep the average global temperature below uh, the average global temperature rise below mm -hmm. two degrees Celsius. Um, the United States has actually pulled out of the Paris agreements. And so the ball is kind of in our court to start making strides to improving climate change mitigation. And actually, China is leading the world in clean energy investment. So they're globally recognized for the efforts that they're making to mitigate climate change. And I guess just something to note, regardless of each country's individual contribution to the climate crisis, climate change is global and it kind of requires an all hands on deck solution. It doesn't matter who put the CO2 up there, we all need to take some strides to control it. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we've talked about climate change is definitely real uh, and we definitely need to do something about it. Um, so if we're going to, you, what's the kind of time frame that we're looking at? Yeah, so there was a report published by the Intergovernmental, 
Governmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the IPCC, in 2018, and they warned that we have until 2030 to cut carbon emissions by 45% before the rise in global temperature reaches a catastrophic tipping point. So 2030 is only 10 years away, and policies take time to be enacted and actually start to have effects on the general world population. So the time to act is now, <laughs> pretty <All right>. much. <laughs> uh, and and you, you sort of you mentioned policies there. Um, so let's get into, you know, talking a little bit about Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, you know, uh, obviously the lobby part, we're talking about, you know, lobbying Congress. Uh, you mentioned policies. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Citizens Climate Lobby and about, you know, yeah. what, what the organization does uh, and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so Citizens Cl Climate Lobby is a nonprofit nonpartisan grassroots advocacy organization focused on national policies used to address climate change. So our organization is very focused. We are focused on the idea that a national carbon fee and dividend would be the most impactful solution to mitigate climate change. So there's 567 active chapters all around the world, actually, so both in the United States and in other countries. Um, and all of these members are focused on educating members of their community, contacting local media, like we're doing right now, um, and interacting with their elected officials about carbon fee and dividend. So right now, there's actually legislation in the House of Representatives. The bill is called H.R. 763, and it's entitled the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend. Act, and I was actually able to lobby for this bill in June um, at the CCL National Conference. That's very cool. Uh, would you mind just uh, talking a little bit more about uh, H.R. 763, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act? Yeah, so um, for short, I'm going to call it EICDA, okay. which is just the acronym, um, but it is a bipartisan climate change solution. So the basic idea of the bill consists of putting a fee on fossil fuels at the site of extraction, and that fee would be paid by fossil fuel companies. Now, the fee is going to gradually increase and drive down carbon pollution from burning fossil fuels because industry will move towards cheaper and cleaner options. Now, in order to not shock the economy from rising prices triggered by the fee for things like gasoline, heating, and electricity, the money collected from the fee will be distributed to American households in equal shares every month. So that's kind of what this infographic is demonstrating, just the fee um, collected by the government, but then completely returned to the people as a dividend. So the bill also includes a border carbon adjustment, meaning products produced with fossil fuels will be taxed and imported when they're imported into the United States. So the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act would cut emissions by 50% by 2034, and that is consistent to the recommendations from the IPCC report um, to avoid catastrophic climate change. Right now, there are 77 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives for the bill. And here in Illinois, we have Dan Lipinski of the 3rd District. Um, he's actually one of the original co-sponsors. Um, and then additional co-sponsors are Jan Schakowsky from, um, of the 9th District, Robin Kelly of the 2nd District, Danny Davis of the 7th, and Chewy Garcia of the 4th. Hey, that's uh, that's my representative. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, if if you didn't hear your representative's name, uh, we'll be talking a little later uh, about um, how to contact your representatives and that kind of thing through the the carbon or through the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby website. Um, okay, so you talked about the there's a carbon fee and then there's a dividend. Um, why, why the, why that structure? Why the dividend? Why not? Because I mean, most taxes, most fees that the government, whether it's city government, state, uh, federal, you, that goes back to the government, and the government spends it how you know, however Congress decides. Why do, why do the dividend uh, part of it? Yeah. So. The whole, the whole intent of the bill is to be revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. Because fossil fuel industry's costs are going to subsequently rise because of this fee put on the site of extraction, um, EICDA wants to provide that dividend so people aren't shocked by the economic 
problems that come along with the rising cost of gasoline. Um, so resources basically provided by fossil fuels are going to become inherently more expensive, and then the dividend is supposed to offset those rising costs. Yeah, and weren't, weren't there just, um, wasn't there was like riots in France around this, right? Yeah. So, and, and so can you talk about that and how this, how the bill basically prevent, prevents what was happening in France? Yeah, so the problem with France is they didn't have the dividend structure along with their carbon fee. They just had the fee, and so all people saw was rising costs of gasoline and no way to adjust for that. Got and it. so um, our situation will be different because there is that dividend structure put in place. And the whole, um, the dividend really is supposed to protect low-income households because mm -hmm. those people would be the most affected by rising costs of uh, utilities and things like that. Okay. Um, so we just we chatted a little bit about uh, France here. It, are, are there places where this this is actually working? Are there places where um, a, a carbon fee and dividend structure is actually working as other places in the world, other countries in the world? Yeah, so um, I have a list right here. So as of January 2019, there are several countries that already have carbon pricing in place. Um, Chile, Colombia, Denmark, the EU, Finland, France, which we discussed a little bit, Ireland, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, and the UK. And actually my favorite example um, of a country that has enacted this is Canada. So they're a really great example of carbon fees being supported by their nation. So Justin Trudeau just won the most recent election um, against candidates who were heavily, heavily criticizing him for enacting the carbon fee, but he won re-election, which shows that people were supportive of that policy and his push for it. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Um, and, and so you uh, you talked a little bit about the about the the, the border uh, border adjustment. Uh, what, what what's the what's the point behind the the border adjustment part uh, of the bill? Yeah. Um, so the details included in the bill for the border adjustment are working to protect American companies. Okay. Um, so the carbon border fee adjustment consists of two main aspects. There's Imports from a country that don't have a comparable carbon fee will have an added surcharge to make up that difference. Um, and then exports to those same countries, um, the company that produced it within the United States will actually get a rebate for using a low carbon manufacturing process. So this border adjustment is just to prevent the carbon fee from putting American businesses at a disadvantage um, in the global market. So this actually puts the United States in a position of leadership for carbon regulations, and it encourages foreign countries to adopt carbon fees to avoid that um, additional import tax. Got it. All right. Wow. Okay. Uh, so we've talked climate change, we've talked Citizens Climate Lobby and the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Uh, let's talk a little bit about you and how you got uh, involved with Citizens Climate Lobby. Yeah, so um, I think I mentioned I'm in college right now. And so when I first got to college, I was really interested in joining environmental clubs. Um, and we did a lot of projects, but I didn't really feel like I was making my voice heard in the world of climate change. And so I really wanted to um, use something like outside of my coursework to really work for these environmental causes. I guess like I should probably mention my career goals. <laughs> um, so I'm studying mechanical engineering and I want to go into renewable energy or some sort of sustainable okay. industry. Um, but my coursework really just wasn't cutting it for me for like wanting to do more yeah. in terms of environmental things. And so I actually met a Citizens Climate Lobby volunteer, Henry Moss, who actually became my faculty mentor on campus. Uh. And he was encouraging me to get involved in the local chapters. And I actually was like, you know what, there's a lot of students that want to get involved in this. And so I worked um, with the higher education group of Citizens Climate Lobby to actually start a chapter on my campus. Um, and then 
I guess to get the ball rolling on campus, we got a budget and took four students from campus to the international conference in June. Um, and so that's when we got to lobby for HR 763. We got to go to different informational sessions. It was a really incredible experience and we all came back with a lot of energy and our chapter has grown from four people to 25. So wow. <laughs> very exciting and I really, really am proud of the work that we've done. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so what, you know, you mentioned a little bit the, the lobby day. What, what's your favorite experience so far as, as a CCL volunteer? Yeah, um, so definitely going to the international conferences up there. Um, it was really cool because First of all, we were surrounded by 1,500 environmentalist people with the same goal of mitigating climate change. And so just being in an environment like that is really refreshing. Um, just in general, people don't share the same beliefs as you. So like being around that energy for <laughs> um, mitigating climate change was really cool. Um, I was a little nervous because I thought that since I was so young, the representatives wouldn't really want to hear from me. Like, I'm unemployed, I'm still in college, like all of these things. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was actually exactly the opposite experience. They were really excited to hear from young people. They were really excited to see young people taking a stand. Um, and so I just felt really valued, which was just really incredible to see, like, tangible effects of yeah. different actions and things like that. That's great. That's really cool. Um, so what are some other activities that, uh, that, that CCL gets involved in? And if, if someone wanted to, to become a volunteer, how would they go about that? Yeah, um, so there's a lot of opportunities to be active within a CCL chapter. I'm actually going to put our information up on the screen. Um, so if you want to join a Chicagoland chapter, um, we have a Facebook page, which um, if you just search that name up there, that should pop up on Facebook. We also have an email account if you wanted to email us. Mm -hmm. um, but the best way to learn more about Citizens Climate Lobby would be going to our website. So there's a lot of cool resources on our website, um, but I guess just within a CCL chapter, um, there's a lot of things to get involved in. So the best way to learn how to get involved is looking up a chapter. So if you click on here, yeah. um, you can uh, so click on the Take Action tab and then go to the Find a Chapter. This will show you all the active chapters throughout the United States so, wow. and throughout the world. So as oh. you can see, there's a ton of chapters. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit more, you can go through the chapter directories and then find um, all the different chapters that you can join. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple for Chicago that you can scroll on down to and check out. And then uh, you mentioned earlier um, yeah, so all, all, the Chicago all, all the representatives. Is there a way that through the website that people can easily contact the representatives and that, that yeah. kind of thing? Um, so that's actually right under this Take Action tab, too. Okay. Um, so if you want to write Congress, there's actually a form online where you can, as it's loading, <laughs> you can actually put in your address and zip code, and then you can search up um, who your representative is, and they have some pre-filled forms for you to mm -hmm. um, send letters. You can also customize them. So I like to customize mine, especially after I met with one of my representatives. Yeah. I was like, hey, it was great to meet with you. Um, you should get on that co-sponsoring, you know. <laughs> um, so, and it actually, if you make an account, it'll save your form. So I just send it out every week. I'm like, hey, remember me? Here's another letter, um, and they make it really easy. They also have a directory online to look up phone numbers, too, if you're more of a phone call type of person. All right, that's really great. Um, so if, if someone were to join a, a CCL chapter um, or, or, or attend an event, mm -hmm. yeah, what might someone expect, be able to expect? Is there any sort of fee to join or anything like that? No, so all you need to bring is yourself and a passion for saving the environment. Um, but in terms of events that we have going on, there's pretty much something for just about every personality type. We have a lot of tabling events where we'll go to art shows or um, like farmers markets or something like that and just sit and talk to members of the community about the House Resolution 763 or about how to write representatives, how to get involved in a local chapter, things like that. 
Um, there's also some op-ed writing campaigns. So if you wanted to submit your opinion on something to a local newspaper, that's also an option. Um, like I said, just writing letters and calling Congress, that's always um, something big to do if you want to be a little bit more of a behind the scenes person. Um, in terms of other events, we have a lot of socials as well. Um, so the CCL local chapters will do um, different parties or they'll go to different places in the community. I know there's a big focus on breweries right now mm -hmm. and there's actually a brewery resolution through Citizens Climate Lobby on getting those leaders of the community to support um, carbon fee and dividend as a solution to climate change. So it's really cool, it's really fun, great casual way to meet volunteers. Um, so yeah. Well, that's great. Awesome. Um, okay, I think that's just about all we have time for today. Uh, so Maddie, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Oh yeah, thank you for having me. This was really fun. And if uh, you want to find out more about Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, you can go to our website there, citizensclimatelobby.org. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want on Facebook, you can go to, ch you can look up Chicagoland Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, and there, are, uh, as Maddie talked about, there's a number of different ways uh, that you can join. So thank you for your time today, uh, and Maddie, again, thank you. Thank you.